All right, so in this video and the next video, we're going to come up with some filter design criteria that are a little bit more precise and how we can take an existing continuous time filter design and kind of port that over or map that over to a, an equivalent discrete time filter. In this video, we're going to look at a time domain criteria that will let us do that. As I noted, our real goal here is to take a continuous time filter and kind of adapt it to an equivalent digital filter and the reason we're doing that is because we're going to assume that we already kind of know how to do continuous time filter design. That's usually one of the first things that you study. On my channel, I have a nice set of videos that talk about how to design Butterworth filters, which are continuous time low-pass filters. You might have studied Chebyshev filters. And there's also very straight uh, forward ways to take a low-pass filter and convert that to a high-pass filter or a band-pass filter or things like that. So there's plenty of existing material for how to go about designing a continuous time filter. Given that you know how to do that, we know how to characterize those filters based on their transfer function, H of S, their Laplace transform of H of T. So that's kind of like their frequency domain characterization. Or if you prefer, you can describe them via H of omega, their frequency response. Equivalently in the time domain, these continuous time filters are described by their impulse response, H of T. So we're going to assume as our starting point, we know either the transfer function, frequency response, or impulse response of our continuous time system. And what we're going to do is come up with a way of designing what I call an equivalent discrete time system. So here's a little nice block diagram for how our continuous time system works. X of t comes into this filter who has a frequency response of h of omega and out comes y of t. What we're going to do is find a way to replace this frequency response with this block right here. So the input is still the same. It's still a continuous time input x of t. But inside of this block, I now have a discrete time system. I'm going to sample my continuous time signal with an a to d to get a discrete time signal x of k. I'm going to run that through some digital filter described by a transfer function h of z or equivalently h of k. The output of that is the output signal y of k, which is a discrete time signal. And then I'm going to turn that back into a continuous time signal with a d to a converter to get back to y of t. If we do our job right, this and this will match up exactly because I've designed a digital system that's equivalent to this system given that I've sampled properly, filtered properly, and done my signal reconstruction properly. So that is our goal here. How do we go about doing that? Mathematically, one of the key things to remember is this discrete time signal that is input to h of z is just our sampled x of t. So remember when we sample x of t, we replace the continuous time variable t with kt, where capital T is the sampling period, and k is our discrete time increment. Very similar thing for y of k. y of k is our discrete time output, and it's very much related to the continuous time version by replacing the continuous time variable little t with k capital t. So that's always a mathematical kind of swap we do when dealing with samples of continuous time signals. All right, so let's go ahead and walk through this criteria. The criteria that we're going to focus on in this video is, given that I have h of t, how do I design an h of k that's equivalent? In the next video, we'll do the same thing, but in the frequency domain. How do I relate the frequency response or transfer function, h of s, to some discrete time transfer function? But for now, let's stay in the time domain. All right, so this is really going to involve just us writing out very core fundamental input-output relationships for a continuous time system, writing out similar relationships for a discrete time system, and then kind of comparing them to see how they match up. For instance, this right here is a fundamental relationship between the input of a continuous time system and the output of a continuous time system. It's called the convolution integral, right? We've written this down many times. If I can evolve my input with my impulse response, I get the output y of t. What we know about integrals, though, is they're really the limits of a Riemann sum, right? So from this line here to this line here, all I've done is replace my integral with its limiting Riemann sum form, okay? That's kind of nice, because when I write it like this, it's almost clear that in this process, I'm really already kind of sampling. I'm grabbing my input function at multiples of delta tau. And same thing here, my time variable tau is replaced with m delta of tau. 
and this is just a Riemann sum, right? I have to multiply by the kind of rectangular width to add up all those strips, and delta tau is getting small. In terms of notation, this looks like I'm sampling f in multiples of delta tau, and I'm sampling a time-shifted h in multiples of delta tau. So instead of using delta tau for notation, let's just switch to capital T, which is what we use to mean the sampling period of our signal, to write down an equivalent Riemann sum just with slightly different notation. The reason I like this one a little bit better now, and you can see what I've done, I've factored the delta tau, which is now t out front, is this now looks like samples of my continuous time signal f, and this looks like samples of my time-shifted impulse response. All right, let's keep going. So I'm gonna go ahead and write this down on the next page because it's an important one. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm going to sample that continuous time signal. So here was the signal I had that was a function of continuous time, a little t. If I sample that, what happens? Well, I replace little t with k capital T. So the t that was here got replaced with kt, and the t that was over here got replaced by kt. Since there was a capital T, I could go ahead and factor out that common term of t. So this is now a, an analytic expression for what I would get at the output of my continuous time system, and then if I sampled it in multiples of kt. So we kind of have a discretized version of our continuous time signal. What happens on the discrete time side of things? Well, I have a very fundamental relationship called the convolution sum that again relates the input and the output via the impulse response. So this is what I would get at the output of my discrete time filter. And what I want is for the output of my discrete time filter and the output of my continuous time system to be the same. So let's see what happens if I compare this equation to this equation, they're practically the same. In fact, this and this are the same thing. It's just a different notation. This is the discretized input as a function of m. This is the sampled continuous time signal as a function of m. This is my impulse response in discrete time. This is my continuous time impulse response having been sampled. So comparing these two things, these equations are practically identical. In fact, this and this are equal. What I'm trying to figure out is what should my discrete time impulse response be? Well, if I want this equation and this equation to be equal to each other, namely y of kt is equal to y of k for all time k, I need this to be equal to this times this. Those are the two things I need to match up. And that's where I now get my kind of time domain criterion. I need my discrete time impulse to be t times the sampled version of my continuous time impulse response. So formally, we can say that over there, here. I need the impulse response of my discrete time system to be equal to the sampling period times my samples of my continuous time impulse response. Ideally, in the limit, I also have that there, right? I want my sampling period to go as small as possible. This original continuous time system was able to process all frequencies. When I sample, I know that I limit the, the frequencies I'm allowed to kind of sample and work with. And if I don't do things properly, I have aliasing. So while this continuous time system could theoretically handle all frequencies, my discrete time system will be limited based on my sampling period. So my sampling period should tend to zero if I want these to truly match. And you can even see that back here, right? The other part, I was kind of pointing out the things that don't match. This and this match up perfectly. The sums match up perfectly. This is a piece that I need to, to kind of throw in, so to speak, to make sure that my discrete time impulse response and this are the exact same thing. So I'm requiring H to equal these two circled pieces up there. All right, so we now know a very nice equation. If you give me H of T, I can easily compute h of k, and it's kind of what you'd imagine, just sample h of t. However, there's a little scale factor to not forget about, and ideally when we sample it, we would sample it as small as possible. So if you give me h of t, I can compute h of k. Now let's just do a few examples. Let's, let's pick kind of the simplest example. Let's say you told me that h of t was just this decaying exponential c e to the lambda t u of t, so it turns on at time zero and decays to the right. How would I go about computing h of k? Well, it's very simple. We sample it and scale by t. 
So here, sampling means replace little t by kt, which I did. I also have a unit step function that should be there. Kind of left that part off accidentally. And then I scale by t. So very simple algebraic substitution to go from the continuous time impulse response to the discrete time impulse response. We can also take this into the frequency domain, right? So in continuous time, I go to h of s and I end up with a single pole. In discrete time, I go to h of z, and again, I end up with a single pole system. This pair is particularly useful because often we can take a transfer function that has lots of poles, right? Maybe a sum of all these different poles, and then we can turn each one of those into a corresponding pole in the z domain. So this is a nice way to do it if you have a lot of poles. We can use kind of this fundamental mapping right here, this pair, and do it for every single pole in the system. However, kind of the fundamental time domain relationship is this very simple one that given an impulse response h of t, all I do is sample it and scale it by capital T. So that's one of our new design techniques that we'll have. In the next video, we'll do something very similar, but in the frequency domain. And then in the next playlist, which you can get to by going over to the members site, we'll actually do some very specific examples of designing these filters in MATLAB. Thanks for watching.